Well, hello everybody. <coughs> right, I want to talk to uh, Neil's presentation and I'd like to tell you my story because my story has formed my uh, path career-wise and has led me to this today. Um, so I'm an archaeologist by trade. I studied archaeology in Florence. I did research excavation across the globe and then... Oh, back. And then uh, since 2004, I've been uh, in commercial archaeology here in England. Um, from the very beginning of my archaeological career, my main fascination and focus has been in the understanding of the physical evidence of magical activity in archaeological context. And of course, coming from Italy and dealing with Etruscan and Roman magic, uh, archaeology, well, as you can imagine, this is easy to do. Uh, very early in my, in my studies, I came across a seminal book which has inspired me and set the path for my career. As you can see here, I'm talking of Rob Merrifield. Uh, this book made me fall in love with the idea that the beliefs and practices connected to magic and witchcraft were not only represented by words and actions, they were also represented by objects and material culture, which have left uh, evidence. And this evidence, when analysed and studied correctly, can offer us important clues regarding not only magic and witchcraft, but also clues on wider caste belief systems. At the time, however, I felt the limitations of the one discipline, archaeology, dealing with such uh, huge and ubiquitous topic. Uh, magic and witch witchcraft are extremely hard to categorize, as the, their perception changes from place to place, historical period, period to historical period, and culture to culture, of course. Um, therefore, I changed my path, and I decided to uh, challenge this topic through history and ethnography, uh, and I decided to do a PhD in history, dealing with archival sources from the Roman Inquisition archive, and also folk sources or ethnographical sources from the um, uh, archive of the folk tradition of Maremma. Um, so to better understand the perception of magic and witchcraft throughout time, I have become an interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary sorry, <laughs> researcher, very difficult word for me to say, or uh, if you like, an in-betweener. So I walk across uh, disciplines, which is a hard thing to do at times. But this, um, this approach, uh, a micro approach to a macro phenomenon, uh, across space and time has allowed me to understand better the limitations of the archaeological approach to the stu study of magic and witch witchcraft tradition. Um, of course, I was not the first one to follow this path. Um, the study of magic and witchcraft in archaeological context, implementing the cognitive processual approach, has developed swiftly, but not without methodological issues, since the last uh, since the uh, late 1980s. And it, it has evolved together with the general interest in the materiality of magic and witchcraft, which belongs to a wider and more recent material cultural term. The scholar who stands out prevalently in Britain for the first and most complete contribution to the development of the archaeological study of magic and witchcraft is, of course, uh, Rob Merrifield. In his book, The Archaeology of Ritual, Ritual and Magic, um, you can see a survey of material objects indicating the existence of ritualistic and magical behavior. The materials studied by Merrifield belong to a Roman and Anglo-Saxon pagan context, and also to medieval and early modern Christian context. And for the first time, a pattern of continuity in ritual deposition from pagan and Christian contexts alike uh, was identified, which, if not indicating or even implying a continuity in the same beliefs, it shows similarity in the modality of certain ritual uh, practices throughout time. The main point in um, Merrifield's work is explained very well in his own words. All who have any interest in that wide field of human thoughts, aspiration, and fears, covered by such terms as religion, magic, and the more derogatory superstition, will be fully aware that it has produced <coughs> immense activity that must have left almost 
as many traces in the archaeological record as any of the basic human activities, activities that are concerned with satisfying hunger, constructing shelter, or providing defence against enemies. Furthermore, his work underlined and brought attention to two major issues, the stubborn reluctance hidden behind methodological and interpretative defensive barricades of archaeologists and historians to engage with material evidence implying magical activities in medieval and early <coughs> modern context, and the general lack of understanding and the misinterpretation of deposits indicating magical activity in archaeological context. These issues, and underlined by Merrifield, were consistently and repeatedly addressed by uh, later researchers. One of them is Brian Hoggart, who in 1999 opened up his article entitled The Archaeology of Folk Magic by saying, in this article, I hope to draw uh, the, the reader's attention to a little known field of study known as the archaeology of folk magic. In this article, Hoggart highlighted uh, the very little interest of archaeologists and historians due to lack of understanding in such an interesting and informed approach to uh, the study of magic and witchcraft. In the same year, he started a survey of objects related to magic and witchcraft practices in Britain, during which 661 museums, innumerable archaeological units, and private individuals were contacted and provided the materials. And here you can find his web page and his research. Moving on with the time, these issues and limitations persisted and they were further addressed and developed by Roberta Hiltzreis, uh, which in 2008 states, it may be that archeologists studying the Middle Ages have found the opposition of magic and Christianity difficult to interrogate based on the false assumption that these are mutually exclusive uh, categories comprising marginal superstition on the one hand versus formalized, formalized religion on the other. More recently, these issues and limitations were widely discussed by British and non-British archaeologists at the 34th Annual Conference of the Theoretical Archaeology Group, or TAG as you know it, held in Liverpool in 2012. During the session entitled The Materiality of Magic, an Artifactual Investigation into Ritual Practices and Popular Belief. This session was so popular that we had to swap into a bigger room, which is an achievement. The papers presented during the session were gathered and edited in a volume published in 2015. Um, the papers in this edited volume uh, draw attention to the methodological issues and difficulties in identifying with certainty the nature of structured deposits, ritual riddles, and ritual deposits in pre-literary context, where interdisciplinary cross-references with folklore and written texts are not possible. Ronald Hutton's edited volume entitled Physical Evidence of Ritual Acts, Sorcery, and Witchcraft in Christian Britain, published in 2016, addresses the issue thoroughly, confirming the longevity of the reluctance of archaeologists and historians to approach material evidence of magic, especially in Christian contexts. Now, as you know it, magic is a per perennial, uh, fascinating subject. Just look around you, media, fashion, books, films, everything. And as such, it holds the imagination of the wider public. Fortunately, in recent time, times, this fascination has taken hold of academia, and the advancement in the study of magical practices from antiquity to modern Europe have created historical narratives which engage, entice, and inspire not only future academics, but also the general public. One obvious example of this is the incredible success of the exhibition held at the Ashmolean Museum. Uh, and I want to show you a small video, if it's still there, um, that ran from September to January, this January.
this was an, an incredible success, um, not just from a public point of view, uh, but also for, um, for the academic advancement of the study in uh, witchcraft and uh, magic. The International Conference kick-started the exhibition, sparked a rather lively, if not aggressive, discussion, mainly between historians and archaeologists, regarding methodological approaches and the lack of <laughs> dialogues between the two categories. Um, the main issue I identified is that despite the increased interest at theoretical and academical level in physical evidence of magic and witchcraft beliefs, at practical level during the actual excavations, archaeological excavations, or incidental discoveries of these objects, neglect and misinterpretation is still the standard routine. In the majority <laughs> of the cases, it is almost impossible to convince um, archaeologists working on a very <coughs> tight schedule, tight budget excavation, um, to convince them that a rolled up piece of lead in an ancient beach or coastal is not just random, <coughs> or to convince contractors working on a building that a shoe in a chimney is not just a random shoe somehow lost up there uh, <laughs> by its owner. So I personally feel that <coughs> until the study of material evidence of magic and witchcraft which is mainstream literature and our modern mental approach to the importance of past magic tradition changes, a good percentage of uh, the material evidence of apotropaic culture, if you like, will end up in boxes on shelves of archaeological units, warehouses, or in spoil pits and skips. So considering the high percentage of archaeological data coming from development-based excavations into academic research, it is worrying to know that there is a huge gap in knowledge and data processing regarding apotropaic material culture and uh, magic tradition. So after the heated debate of the Spellbound Conference last September, I have decided to get quite active and I've, I've been asking many of my colleagues working in conventional archaeology a set of standard questions to understand if it, if it is actually true uh, that they lack interest. So the questions were mainly, do you think um, that apotropaic material culture or magical material culture is worth recording? Would you be able to identify in the field any of the objects belonging to the main categories of what we consider apotropaic material culture? How would including apotropaic material evidence in the routine uh, methodology of commercial archaeology impact on time schedules and budgets? Well, the response which followed uh, had a standard pattern, I would say. Everybody I spoke to agree on the fascination and interest uh, of the topic. Everybody agreed that apotropaic material culture is worth recording uh, because it's part of our cultural heritage. However, and this is a massive however, everybody agreed that not only they would not be able to identify quickly the objects in question, but they, the majority of them thought that looking for these objects and analysing them within their own context would actually not be feasible in the current methodology implemented in commercial archaeology. The responses given to me um, follow a very logical and financially focused models of branding, of course. Um, I am, uh, most of, for most, I am a commercial archaeologist myself, so I understand the stress of uh, winning tenders, the stress of keeping an excavation within budget and within, within time schedule. We must be competitive at all the time. We have to be able to please the clients, um, the local authorities, the consultants, and the public. And I understand that. But, and this is the core of my argument today, is it not perhaps time to remember that we commercial archaeologists are not just diggers. We are, to a certain extent, keepers or creators, if we uh, really follow Neil's idea, um, of heritage. And as such, we should be given the credit and the support to be able to perform our role within our own job specification 
and to be able to inspire the wider public to understand and embrace their own cultural and historical heritage, represented in this case by objects indicating a past spiritual belief system. I therefore take this opportunity today to formally address the CIFA to take a closer look at the issue and to develop an official methodology and strategy which would support and educate field archaeologists, uh, allowing commercial archaeologists to make space for average faith, material culture, and uh, magic fruition. To conclude, because I like Neil's presentation so much, I would like to quote him. Uh, he said, the material in the ground is not archaeology. It's not a precious artifact. It's not treasure. It's just stuff. It is the process of archaeology and the thoughts and ideas of archaeologists that transform this stuff into a cultural product. What product it is transformed into is up to us. So if we, field archaeologists, are no longer inspired in understanding important aspects of our, of our own past and culture, and if we are not fully supported by our governing bodies, then how can we inspire the wider public and future generation? So I personally believe it is time to bring a little magic and spark back into commercial archaeology. Don't you? Thank you.